There are times when we sing God's praises like that, and I look out and I see just the expressions on your faces. Of sometimes some folks come and they're just smiling and they're just singing their praise to God. And others may have a, a more of a strained look on their face because they know the truth of what they're singing, and yet everything that they're experiencing. Sometimes it might be a challenge to sing those things. But just like we said last week, sometimes last week we, we were in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. I'm going to give away a part of a pop quiz. But it told us to rejoice always. And there are just times in life when it's hard to rejoice. And so we decided last week that even if we don't feel like rejoicing always, do you remember we are going to rejoice anyway? <laughs> We're going to rejoice. And I, I saw that on some of you guys' faces, that you may not felt like rejoicing, but you were just rejoicing anyway. And God's going to honor that. And you're going to get through whatever it is that you're facing, whatever struggle you're going through, and you're going to find how God has honored that. I want you to join us in Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 8. Paul wrote these words to the Philippians, and they're very similar to the words that he wrote to the Thessalonians that we read last week. Before we read God's word, I just want to tell you, as I was preparing this sermon, I saw a study that was done about anxiety. We're talking a little bit about anxiety today and its relationship to prayer. <laughs> prayer is an antidote for anxiety. And as I was reading the, the results of this study, it just they basically summarized it by saying this. 40% of the things that people worry about never happen. 40% of the, the things that we worry about never happen. But then they went on. They said 30% of the worries that we have are related to things in the past, things that have already happened, they're done and over, and we're still worrying about them. 12% of our worries have to do with our health, even though we may not be showing any symptoms of any kind of illness. We're still worried about our health. I can't help but think within the last year and a half or two years that percentage has probably gone up. 10%, <laughs> I don't know if you're keeping track of uh, keeping the, adding it up, but 10% of worry is about our friends or our neighbors, even though in most cases there's just no reason to worry. There's no signs that anything is going on. There's no pending, you know, tragedy or doom getting ready to beset them. 10%, we worry about our friends, our neighbors, even though there's no reason for that worry. And then 8% of worry just seems, only 8% of worry, seems to actually have some basis in reality. 92% of the things that we worry about aren't worth worrying about. I, I, that's just a big number to me. I don't think I ever realized that. So now, I, since I've read that, I'm kind of analyzing everything that I worry about. <laughs> Is this really worth worrying about? <laughs> Let's read our text together and see what Paul has to say about it. In verse 4, Paul says to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, 
whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence or if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Think about these things. Let's pray together. Lord, it is so easy for us to get wrapped up and, and caught up in so many different situations around us. And we worry and we're so anxious and we just carry all that on us like a weight bearing that down on us. And Lord, we don't mean to. Your word tells us, do not be anxious. And so Lord, we are here today to seek how we can reconcile our experience with your word. Lord, I just pray that you would show us a better way. Because what we're doing a lot of times right now, what we're doing, it just isn't working. What we're doing is not working for us. It's not bringing us the peace that you desire to give us. It's not bringing us the victory that we desire to walk in that comes only from you. And so, Lord, I pray that in these few verses through your word that you would show us your peace. Show us how we can avoid worry and anxiety and live a more meaningful and fulfilling life for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been in a series on prayer, and there's a lot of things that we, that we can say about prayer. Last week, we kind of emphasized uh, about how prayer helps us to draw closer to God, and it can uh, deepen our relationship with God. And that, you know, who, who wouldn't want that? God wants that. Why shouldn't we want that? But today we're going to focus on how prayer can be practical for us, how it can be practical in the way we live our lives. It doesn't just improve our relationship with God. That's great. But as we improve our relationship with God, it helps us in our everyday lives as well. We'll see how prayer fits in a daily regimen that will help to alleviate anxiety and it can lead us to peace that is beyond imagination, beyond our comprehension. So the first uh, thing about prayer is that we want to see as it relates to anxiety is that Paul gives us in these verses a requirement to rejoice. This isn't just a suggestion. Last week, you remember the verse? First, I kind of gave it away earlier. First Thessalonians 5, 16. What does it say? Go ahead, you know it. <laughs> Rejoice, always. Rejoice always. It's a two-word verse. That's why it's so easy to remember. <laughs> right. Revo re Rejoice always. Rejoice always. Let's go ahead and try a second question on the pop quiz here. You remember what verse 17 said? It was also two words. Pray. 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 We'll take that. Pray continually. Pray continually. Very good. Verse 18 was a little harder. It was five words. Anybody remember that one? Okay. Give thanks in all things. You got it. Very, very good. So she memorized three verses. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Very good. So in our text today, we see Paul kind of starting out the same way with the Philippians that he did with the Thessalonians, saying, Rejoice. Rejoice. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. He doesn't say it just once. He says it twice. Again, I say rejoice. I think Paul wants us to pay attention to that. That's why he repeats it. What is it about rejoicing that's so important? He said it to the Thessalonians, and now he's saying it again to the Philippians. And I can't help but wonder, are the, are the Philippians, maybe they're a little more hard-headed than the Thessalonians. That's why he has to say it twice. <laughs> Or was it the opposite way? He saw that the Thessalonians didn't get it the first time, so he figured he'd repeat it for the Philippians. I know if he was, uh, you know, looking at my life, he'd probably say it seven or eight times. <laughs> rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Here's what's really important that we need to know. Rejoicing fills a void. Rejoicing fills a void. There is something within us. We are created as beings who need to worship, and we need to praise, and we need to cry out to God. 
You know, on Wednesday nights at our prayer time, we've been just studying this, this method of prayer. It's called the ACTS method of prayer. How many of you have ever heard of that? A-C-T-S. A couple of hands go up, a couple of heads nodding. For those of you who don't know, I'll just break it down for you real quick. A stands for adoration. And when we pray, we need to spend time just talking to God about how awesome he is. Just rehearsing all of the things that are wonderful about him. Now, this is different from Thanksgiving. I have found in my life that I quickly move into thanking God for all the things that he's done, but I don't spend enough time just praising him for who he is because he is worthy of that. He is so worthy to be praised, the creator of the universe, the one who sustains our lives, who has given us everything. We just praise him for who he is. And a lot of times we, you know, we fail to do that. So when we don't do that, we leave a void, right? It's a void that needs to be filled. We'll talk about that later. We leave this void that, well, we'll talk about it now. We'll leave this void that will quickly be filled by other things, things that we don't necessarily want in our lives, but things that will not hesitate to move in and take over if we leave this void unaddressed. The devil and the world are more than happy to fill this void in our lives. Think about that. Have you ever thought about that? We don't pay attention to these, these voids, to these blind spots in our lives, and if we don't, somebody else will. A good example is how we settle into negative thought patterns. We settle into these negative thought patterns because we're focusing on the wrong things. And when we, instead of focusing on God, you know, it, it doesn't take long to, you, you, think you're, you think you're a positive person, and, you know, one day it just smacks you in the face. I'm not a positive person. I'm always complaining. I'm always bitter. I'm always worried. I'm always, you know, we fall into this negative thought pattern. Paul says to rejoice. Rejoice always. And when we find ourselves in that negative thought pattern, it ought to trigger a thought. Hey, I've got a void in my life that's been filled by something else that I don't want there. Paul says to the Corinthians in chapter 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, that we are to take every thought into captivity. That means if we're not intentional in controlling our thoughts, we leave a void that the devil will gladly move in and take control. Now, as I listen to this, and as I, as I think through this, and I'm saying this, this sounds very similar to a lot of prosperity gospel. This sounds very similar to maybe even a lot of pop psychology. And you know what I say to that? It is. But if those things are incomplete, because they may leave out the truth of God's word. It comes, you know, it's not an original idea. Paul said it, and God get inspired him to say it. Rejoice in the Lord always. Control your thoughts. It's not just about having positive thoughts and, you know, all that, but it's about rejoicing in the Lord and letting your relationship with him build so that you are moving into a positive mental aspect and positive thought patterns, not based on what you want or what you're wishing for, but based on what God is showing you and what his will for your life is. That's why Paul says rejoice in the Lord always. If we fill our minds with the things of God, we leave no room for the devil to work. A great way to start rejoicing well, you might say I don't have much to rejoice about, but there is a qualifying phrase in verse 4. It says, in the Lord. In the Lord. In a few moments, we're going to talk about the peace of God, but we can't really attain peace of God if we aren't in the Lord. It starts with rejoice in the Lord. See, if I'm looking at my abilities and my wisdom and my talent, 
my wealth, anything like that, then I don't have much to rejoice about. Absolutely, because those things can vanish in the blink of an eye. They can be gone. But when you look back through history, God has demonstrated his power and his wisdom all throughout history. Man, mankind has experienced too much of God's goodness and his kindness not to have cause to rejoice. I personally, and I hope you can say the same thing, I've had too much history with God, too much personal experience with God and how he has worked in my life for me not to rejoice. I mentioned the ACTS prayer, the adoration. A stands for adoration. Rejoicing is an expression of our adoration for God. When we rejoice in the Lord, as I said earlier, we rehearse who he is. We also remember what he's already done and, and how he's worked through history. We are mindful of what he is doing right now at, at this present moment in our lives. And we are reminded of his promises and what he says he'll do in the future. We have so much to rejoice. It shouldn't be a requirement should just be a natural habit, shouldn't it? Another thing that Paul speaks of is he makes a request for reasonableness. Boy, this is one that as I think about it and go through it, I could really chase a couple of rabbits. I can get on a soapbox here and I'm going to try to avoid doing that. But when I listen to the way people talk in our society anymore, isn't there such a flair for the dramatic. I mean, where is the reasonableness anymore? When you see videos being posted on social media of road rage incidents, people fighting over their place in line at the grocery store, all these, where is, has reasonable just, has it just gone, disappeared? Has it just gone away? You know what? Those are extreme examples. There might be some that hit a little closer to home. My children come to the house on a day like today, and they'll say, oh, I am literally freezing to death. <laughs> That's a big word nowadays, literally. Kids use it like crazy. Or they'll come in, oh, I'm just, oh, just starving. I'm literally starving to death. And I'm sitting there thinking, I literally don't think you understand the meaning of the word literally. <laughs> But that is an example, that's maybe a little milder example of how our, our society is addicted to the dramatic. We are addicted to the dramatic. It's just crazy how you see it playing out throughout society. Those behaviors, those expressions, they, they just reveal that reasonableness has just kind of gone out the window. Come on, people, let's be reasonable here. Reasonableness projects an inner calm and a self-control that reigns regardless of the fluctuating emotions of others. I, over the last few years, I've kind of caught myself saying those kinds of things, and I have begun to be very, very intentional to try and just eliminate that drama coming out of my mouth. Eliminate that drama coming in to my mind and in my heart and through my eyes and however it gets there. I'm trying to, 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 to weed all that out. Again, taking every thought into captivity. Reasonableness identifies someone who is of a gentle spirit. The word reasonableness in verse 5 is also translated in other uh, other. Translations as moderation, graciousness, gentleness. Gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit, isn't it? All of those words apply. We are to put on display the fruit of the Spirit. And you remember last week we talked about joy being a fruit of the Spirit in Galatians chapter 5. And we also mentioned 
before those verses, I believe it's starting in seven, verse 17 of chapter 5, there was a list of the things we were to put away, the things of the world that we're to put away, and we are to put on these fruits of the Spirit. Let these things be evident in our lives. A request for reasonableness. Anybody ready to step up and honor that request? And then Paul goes on to offer a reminder of the Lord's presence and the Lord's return. I love him. He says, the Lord is near. Just that simple phrase, the Lord is near. And for a lot of us, that's just what we need to hear. It's okay. The Lord is near. You see a child in trouble. I remember when uh, I was learning to ride my bicycle or doing something new and my father was there and if I wrecked, it's okay, son, I'm here. It's okay, son, I'm here. I remember one time I climbed up on top of the house to get a Frisbee that got stuck up there and my dad I had to jump down and my dad was going to catch me and all he would say is, I'm here, I'm here. Some of you may have done that in a swimming pool trying to encourage your child to jump off the diving board. It's okay, I'm here. And Paul gives us that reminder, the Lord is here. The Lord is near. When, we're, when we are down and discouraged throughout the Psalms, we're reminded that God is close. I love the psalm that says, God is close to the brokenhearted. I think of Miss Helen today. God is close to Miss Helen today. When we rejoice and we sing, just like we did earlier, I know many of you felt his presence with us today. And Psalms remind us that God inhabits the praise of his people. When we feel isolated and separated from God, the Psalms even remind us that there is nowhere we can go to escape his presence. If you want to know about God being near, spend some time in Psalms. You'll see a lot about it. Edward Pillar, he's a pastor in the United Kingdom, he wrote, <clears throat> at the heart of the good news of Jesus is the announcement that God is near. You remember we sang about it at Christmas. Emmanuel, God with us. The announcement that God is near. God is not a distant and aloof deity requiring sacrifice before he draws close to sinful humanity. In Jesus Christ, God has come close. Whatever we experience in our lives, in our relationships, or in our workplace, the Lord is near, not just in church. The Lord is near everywhere. Whatever we go through in the struggle to follow Christ Jesus and to witness to his lordship, the Lord is near. This statement is intended to bring comfort and consolation to encourage and strengthen the resolve of everyone who has ever stepped out on the journey of discipleship. When we make a decision to follow the Lord, we need to be reminded that the Lord is near. And in addition to that, that the Lord's return is near also. Verse 6 goes on to tell us do not be anxious about anything. And when we're reminded that the Lord is near, we should not have to be anxious about anything. Unless our relationship with the Lord needs some work. <laughs> that might cause a little anxiety. But verse 6 says, do not be anxious about anything. But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. We become anxious because we know that we're not perfect. We may become anxious even as followers of Christ because we know that we let the Lord down so many times and we beat ourselves up over it over and over again. And the Lord basically is saying, don't be anxious. Come to me. Let's talk about it. Through prayer and supplication, you can bring your requests to God. You know, I told you about adoration being the first part of the Acts prayer. You're probably wondering, well, what's the rest of it? The C stands for confession. 
when we pray, we certainly need to talk to God about all those times that we have let him down, the times that we have failed him. He knows about it. It's not a surprise to him. And he wants us to talk to him about it. The T stands for thanksgiving. That's when we spend a lot of time just thanking God for how good he is to us and for all that he's given us. And we can just thank him for all that. And then the S is supplication right here in this verse. It's when we can bring our request. Lord, I really need this. Lord, I really need that. Lord, I want to pray for my friend or my family member. There's those, that's when we come to God and bring our requests. So A-C-T-S, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication. I want to challenge you maybe to use that as a model of your prayer. If you don't already have a model to pray by. If you find it difficult to pray, use that as an outline to help you spend time talking to God. After the requirement, the request, and the reminder, we're also given a result that we can expect. There's this result of rest and righteousness. If we look at verse 7, it says, And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts, <clears throat> and your mind's in Christ, in Christ Jesus. That peace. Oh, I think every one of us has probably experienced it at some point, and every one of us would agree it doesn't seem to stick around very long. That's not God's fault. <laughs> God wants us to have that peace, but a lot of times we get pulled away, we get distracted, and we voluntarily walk away from the peace of God right back in to anxiety and worry and frustration and discouragement. Maybe we're not rejoicing always. Maybe we're not very thankful. Maybe we're not spending the time in prayer talking to God that we need to spend. God has given us the, the road map to peace. And he's given us, Paul has told us, <clears throat> how to get there. He's laid it all out. I find it interesting how there always seems to be this com contrast between our prayer life and the things that ought to be a part of our prayer life and then how on the other end of the spectrum there's worry and anxiety and frustration. We don't have to stay there. We don't even have to go there. Even in the midst of trying times, we can still have peace. We can still be thankful. We can still have joy in spite of whatever may be going on in our lives. I love verse 8 there. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, honorable whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. I mentioned the psychology and the pop psychology and the similarities of what we were saying. There's actually a therapy called replacement therapy. Have you ever heard of that? You know, and as it relates to our thoughts, we're supposed to intentionally think about certain things and avoid thinking about other things, right? I think Paul has given us a list of things to think about. A whole, a nice long list of things to think about. And if we will take every thought into captivity, as he told the Corinthians, think about these things. Spend time rejoicing and thanking and just rehearsing who God is and what he's done for us in prayer. We can do that to God. And we can do that with one another. If we, if we do these things, I think we found the antidote for anxiety. And he goes on to say in verse 9, What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace 
will be with you twice. He says, the God of peace will be with you. I hope you walk out today with a different outlook on life. I hope you walk out with a blueprint of how you can structure your prayer life so that in the coming days, you will see a big difference. This isn't just about your emotions or your feelings. This is about, obviously, improving your relationship with the Lord, drawing closer to, the, to Him. And your feelings and emotions are a byproduct of that. You will begin to see a change. And I can say that because over the last three weeks, as I have taken these things to heart, I have seen a change. And I'm sitting here thinking, how can I share this so that others will just get it, you know? I hate to see people wandering around in misery. We have a hope. We have a future, as Jeremiah told us. God has plans for our good to prosper us and not to harm us. Paul's telling us the blueprint of how we can improve our prayer lives and our relationship with God so that we do not have to wrestle with anxiety and worry. We can live in victory, and we can live in peace. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you so much for this antidote for anxiety. God, I know there's been a lot of times that I myself have wallowed in misery because I have not followed your blueprint for my life. Prayer is just one element of it, but there's a lot of other areas where I have failed you time and time again. And it always seems to be refreshing each time I figure out I need to get back to you. I need to get back to your word and your ways and your plans for my life. And as I do, I begin to experience joy. I begin to experience peace. I begin to eliminate the drama and experience that gentleness in my life. And reasonable, reasonableness begins to return. Lord, I thank you so much that you have given us your word and your desire is for us to enjoy those things. There's no mystery about it. You made it clear. Father, I pray that you would just challenge each and every one of us to accept your blueprint for our lives and to build our lives so that they would bring honor and glory to you and that we could be drawn closer and closer to you and bring others with us. We thank you for the time we've had this morning and we thank you for your word and for the, for the praise that we've been able to offer. And Lord, now as we leave this place, we're going to go right back into the same situations we came from. But Father, I pray that we would go and be able to view those situations differently. That we would be able to go in victory and in peace and confidence knowing that you are there. You are near. And so Lord, we thank you for this time. And we love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Can you can be still and know that I am God. Sure. Be still. Last week, and I look forward to seeing you again next time.